All right, so it is the usual, our usual Tuesday night meeting of Schiffer Circle Community Doula Program. I am some Sarah Morgan for the folks who will run into this on, on YouTube. Um, one of the things that I wanted us to talk about tonight is what on call means. Two things I'm going to talk about. One is going over what on call means, because a couple of things have come up recently and I've, I'm rather upset about it. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, when we are blessed to do a home birth and how we should be positioning ourselves as doulas working with midwives and working with families uh, birthing their little babies at home. Okay. So um, first, you know, I'd like to put it out to you guys, especially the more experienced doulas. What does it mean for this practice? Other people might do different things, but we do our thing. Uh, around that, what does it mean uh, when a client's on call? What, what does it mean to be on call for a client? Kathleen, I'm gonna ask you. You had your hand up first anyway. I was like, ready to go. Um, so being on call specifically for the practice means that at 37 weeks, you have your phone on mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. When I've been on call, my phone is right next to my head, full volume. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it is not consuming anything that would inhibit my ability to be present with my client and get to my client safely and have to transport any one else um, or having to transport the client. Mm -hmm. So no drinking, no drugs, no I mean, I, if you are taking some kind of medication, that's something that you need to be like in consideration of and have conversation with Samsara about. Absolutely. Um, and being within, you know, depending on how far away your client lives from you, um, within a half an hour or an hour away from your client. Um, so that if something starts happening or happens very swiftly, because there certainly are those situations, especially um, second babies, especially, especially second babies or after second babies, <laughs> um, after the first, <laughs> you know, being, being able to get to your client as soon as you can, uh, that is my understanding of being on call. And if you have things that are coming up, um, if you have some type of not availability, then making sure that your second doula knows that, making sure that Samsara knows that, and making sure you have backup um, and giving lots of notice and taking into consideration, hey, if I'm going to be on call, that means that really I might not be able to go fly somewhere <laughs> um, and, and to know that you might have to leave, you know, some previous engagements if your client needs you, because that's a commitment that you made to them. That sounds oh, great. Off, get off my soapbox. Thank, thank you. Well, you were asked to speak, so that's not, not considered a soapbox. Is there anything left out of that, Mika, that you can think of? I was I, that was very comprehensive it really was um, yeah, yeah that sounded good to me. um this is the the the, the primary part other than the birth itself this is the primary portion of our responsibility to our client that they trust that we are going to be there and we are going to be there with them through the birth of their child. They have no idea what doctor is gonna show up when they go to the hospital or if they're even gonna like that person. They have no idea of the circumstances that they're gonna walk into, into in their, their hospital birth. And especially in a home birth, 
when they really didn't need to have a doula, actually, because the midwife could have handled it all. So they're actually being very lovely to us to invite us into that, into that setting. Generally, midwives have second midwives and apprentices and all kinds of stuff that could be doing all the stuff that we're doing. Okay, so we're very honored when a mom invites us into her home birth. And uh, we're very, uh, we have a serious responsibility in a country with, with a horrible track record of abusing birthing people uh, to make sure that we are there for them. When, and not just physically there, emotionally there, mentally there, spiritually there, there for them as, they are, as they're going through this journey of having their kids, again, especially first time moms, because they're scared to death. They have no idea. They're trying to be brave. Most of our clients want to have a natural birth, but they don't even know what that means. They got no clue. They haven't done it yet. Most of them have seen horror and heard horror from their friends and family. And everybody thinks they're crazy to even wanna have a natural birth. And the one person that's gonna stand by them and uh, support their desire uh, and help empower them to remember that they actually can do this, that their body really can do this is us. So it's not like at, you know, an office job where if you're not at your desk, somebody else can pick up your work. And even if you have a co doula, even when you have a backup, the goal is not to use your backup. The goal is for you to be at the birth. That means there needs to be some really big reason why you're not going to be at the birth. You know, is something happening that makes you emotionally, mentally, spiritually unable to do that birth? That, that needs to be a pretty big, big deal. Pretty big thing. You know, clients give us due dates. So we know like two weeks before that due date, and two weeks after that due date, that baby can come anytime in that window. So if you agree to take a client with a specific due date, you got to look at your calendar and consider whether, you know, well, taking a family trip, how close is it to that due date? every once in a blue moon. And also as a doula, you're tracking your clients. So you know the ones who aren't eating. You know, it's pretty apparent. We ask them about food every single visit. Every single visit. And it is like clockwork that the ones who are not eating, the kids are gonna come early. Is that not the case? folks who are already working with clients. We know. So, so you know, that, that trip that your family's taking, best to know is from your own prof professional knowing, I need to stay close. Because this baby could come any old time. Mom is stressed out. Mom is fighting with the partner. There's a lot of trauma. Someone's about to lose their job. We are hearing all this stuff. We know what's going on with them. They're sharing it with us every time we talk to them because we ask, unlike all the medical people they're talking to, not one of them going to ask them how they actually feel, think, know, no one. No one's going to ask them that. But we do. So there's no separation from that knowledge to our personal plans. Do doulas get to have personal time? Of course they do. We use that due date as a guide to plan having our personal time. If we want to do this professionally, we want to do this like it matters to us. But that 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 person who's bonded with us and our co doula, the cl the clients love us. Does that love matter?
So if that love matters, we're going to give it a primacy in our life. It is more important than anything. Right? Now, some of us have little children. That's a hard one, isn't it? Okay. So little ones are, you know, if you have a sick child, you can't go to a birth. Because little humans are the only people that trump our clients. And little sick humans probably mean that we have a bug that we would bring to our clients, which makes us unable to do a birth. With great sadness. So when you're texting a client that you have to disappoint them, you're not just canceling a dentist appointment. You wanna to speak to them in person. You don't text disappointing news to a client. Do not do it. I will not be Miss Smiley Samsara <laughs> if I hear about that from a doula of mine. The client might go, well, that's okay, that's okay. Oh, that's okay. doesn't mean it's actually okay. And the way we work, there is another wonderful doula who cares and loves about that client who can step in. But if you're the primary doula, they bond with you in a very particular way. I've had to deal with, you know, for the first time in my life with, with the, this no. health diagnosis that I have. Um, I've had you got muted. Sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Um, so it, I'm, I'm also expressing my frustration about uh, having to miss birth. I used to be able to say that I never miss birth. I can't say that anymore because my health is kind of fragile at the moment. Um, and I've had to learn to accept my bodily limitations and then let my clients know when I have bodily stuff coming up that prevent them, prevent me from being with them and then communicate that in a way that I feel that they can receive it and apologize for it as often as reasonably possible. <clears throat> apologize when you have to make the first disappointment apologize later after the birth, being happy that they had a wonderful birth and expressing sorrow again, that I wasn't there with you at that moment. When I write the birth narrative, I write the birth narrative saying, what a beautiful scenario. And again, I grieve that I was not there with you, but in person, but I was there with you in spirit and I was there with you in my heart, in my soul. Because even though I was not physically at my birth, I'm still telehealthing. So still kind of with them. And fortunately, that has worked for, for my clients so far that I've had to, with the ones I've had to miss their births. And they do report to me that they could feel that I was still there with them, even though I wasn't physically with them. And that's my goal. So if at all possible, if at all possible, while you're working with, uh, sick youngins or whatever's going on with your clients. If now, now that the concept of virtual dueling is a thing, uh, be clear to like be checking in and be available by phone for what's going on with your client. So the client still has that essence and feeling that they didn't get abandoned. Way too many times I'm hearing so many stories while I'm fighting to make sure that we even exist in California in any kind of healthy way, I spent most of the afternoon trying to work out what the state of California's designation of what a doula is and how we're gonna be able to practice is, it, it, you know, it's a very frustrating and actually kind of dangerous time for our profession. And I hear so many stories from folks outside of this practice, because in my humble opinion, this is the best doula practice anybody would see anywhere. 
But outside of my practice, I get way too many clients telling me how my, the doula just didn't show up at my birth. Or, and these people have paid these people. So I'm getting this from second time parents who are telling me about their first experience when they had a doula and it all went south because she didn't show up. Well, she did this nonsense, which is not allowed in, in this practice. If y'all want to do stuff away from me, I'd be far away from me with my name, not attached to anything. Because I believe if there was such a thing as doula malpractice, it would be malpractice. This thing about doulas leaving in shifts. I'm, I'll be with you for 12 hours and then I'm gone. What makes that any better then the nice nurse who says, good night, have a nice baby, I'm leaving. Or the nurse midwife who's like, well, gee, I really wish I could see your baby being born, but I gotta go, my shift is over. What makes our care any better than that? And what about breaking that connection could affect that person's labor, could affect oxytocin levels? can affect her sense of safety. So please, folks, when we're, it, this, is, this is the most beautiful work in the world and one of the most challenging jobs in the world. You're there with your client for many, many hours. We have to refrain from that, you know, the eggnog with the rum in it. It's, it's Christmas time. People have, people's partners are having office parties. All this stuff is going on. In, Mar in, in, in California, we're free to have all the marijuana we want in the, safe, in the safety of our homes. But if you're on call, none of that, none of that, none of that because our crystal clear selves have to show up at that person's bedside. And when we're going through a birth with a client, we are her memory. Mamas forget a lot of what happened. Most of what happened. We are the client's memory of her experience. That's why we take all the pictures. We take pictures because it helps us write the birth narrative afterwards because it's hard to remember every little thing that happened. I'd rather take pictures than be sitting around in the corner scribbling notes, frankly, when someone's in labor. We have pictures of everything that happened. And then when we sit down with our clients at our closure meeting and we review the birth and we look at those pictures together, there's so much that the mom was like, I didn't even know that happened. Oh my God, I have no idea that that happened because we are the sacred holders of that laboring person's memory. And at that meeting, at that 30 day meeting, when she's emotionally and spiritually ready to receive her story back, we make sure she gets it back because it belongs to her. And the loss of that memory could result in all kinds of things that people haven't bothered to study because people don't really care what happens to women and how they feel and if they survive and if they live and if they die. But we do, we do. So we wanna be wide awake to remember it all and to remember all of the, all of the responsibilities we have of Taking, taking pictures of that board so we know the names of all the doctors and nurses who came into the, into the room. We wanna be there if the partner was having a hard time. You know, we, we wanna be there to be helpful, to be present and to be, uh, be what makes us worth having in the space actually physically helpful to that birthing person. So any questions or feelings or comments about all of that? Anybody want to add anything, subtract anything?
someone's got to be feeling something. That was a lot that I just said. Go ahead, I'm actually oh. Davina and then Kim. Davina actually had her hand up and then she had her. I was just going to say that like we're going through the difficulty of that in our house at the moment, being that we have one car and two kids yep. and the need to like make money and Kelvin having to decide if he can take a gig or not because he needs to be able to take the car home right and watch the kids and so it's been tricky um and we're we're sort of thinking maybe we need to you know after I'm on call currently so maybe once she delivers having a little bit of time until we can save up enough to get another car before I'm agreeing to be on call for people so that it's just not this it's tricky you know we're really definitely having to navigate a lot of things so these are important things to to consider yeah you know is your client close enough that you could hop into like a lift um 30 minutes away so I could, but it would be an expensive lift. Be an expensive lift. We are not in the position to be dishing out lift bills at the moment. So I understand. You know, it's all the pieces. Well, sure. this is one of the reasons why it's good to charge a fee that will support you if you had to jump into a lift. Right, right. Or child care if needed or something. I'm definitely thinking of all of the additional costs that could be incurred that I don't want to pass on to my clients, but in order for me to do what I need to do, they are, you know, thankfully it's worked out in the past, but <laughs> yeah. And it is very important for you to find a co doula for yourself in there in your area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because frankly, I consider it very dangerous for a doula to practice without a co doula or a backup doula or somebody who agrees to back you up. Even I, do I do have a backup thing. That's good. But it is obviously I would prefer to be there. And so there's just all the yeah. figure out. Okay, so you do have a backup, so I'm not gonna spank you. That's great. <laughs> no working without a backup. But a co doula is even more comfy. Yeah. Yeah. It's way more comfy. And your client has met the backup doula? Um, she knows her already. That's what I'm talking about. So your backup doula is, we want to make sure the way we work, our clients know our backup, hopefully from appointment one and loves both of y'all. And although they will have a disappointment at the co-doula, so at, at the primary doula not being there, it's tempered mm -hmm. by the fact that I do I know this person, I like this person. And, you know, it's a, my other sister doula is coming. One of my sister doulas is coming, not a stranger. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Good work thinking about all that stuff, Davina. Anything else you wanted to say? No, that was it. That's all. Kim, what do you want to say? Um, first, I was going to say, Davina, I hear you about the car. That is definitely something that I have struggled with, too, with having just one car. But uh, I, everything you were saying, Samsara, was really bringing up a lot of emotions for me because I, I feel like in all the different jobs I've had, different, very, very jobs, I've never felt so much responsibility as I do now being on call because I feel... Um, because it is every second of the day. I have my phone next to me and, oh, I didn't charge it. Oh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I just agreed to a show. Um, and I, I really feel like, um, I feel that the heaviness of the responsibility and it's, it can be stressful at times because, you know, if it's the middle of the night, I have my, I make sure, is it charged? Uh, am I ready to go? Is there a car? Where's my husband? If the, if I'm not here, plan A, B, and C in case the kids are with me and my husband's not around. So it really does feel like a huge responsibility and having a backup doula, having a co doula does definitely, you know, lift some of that weight. Uh, although, like you were saying, I would never want to miss 
uh, that birth. And right now, of course, you know, I have a specific mama that I'm working very close with and she doesn't have a partner and she has three kids. And so the responsibility feels so heavy. She's also a little bit far away from me and mm -hmm. it's her fourth baby. So it could be quick. And so all of these are coming together. And I, I'm like, you know, I'm not sleeping very well just because I don't want to miss it. I really want to be there. And it, I just wonder too, how you're able to manage that stress sometimes, honestly. I also have another birth that is supposed to be the 6th of January, but she's also asking to be induced earlier. And she's, anyway, that's a different story, but I'm afraid they could come together. And I really want to rely on having, you know, somebody else in case I couldn't be there, which I don't think it'll come to that. But anyway, I, I guess my question to the circle too, and to you, Samsara, is how do you deal with that? It's such a big weight and responsibility because I do want to honor my moms and I want to be there and I want to be the best that I can for them. And it does feel hard sometimes. Well, thank you for the question. I mean, first and foremost, you need to watch your dates and not put yourself in a position as much as possible right. to have overlaps that are too great, especially when you're first starting out. Kathleen was, Kathleen and I were monsters. <laughs> Kathleen is one of the bravest doulas I've ever worked with. That girl was like, <laughs> you are. I'm sorry, I've worked with a lot of people. I get to say some stuff about that. I would say, oh, well, Kathleen, you know, the mom is due on the 20th. Why not do on the 20th and what do on the 25th? And what do you the think? Babies, you know. The babies are kind. Their little spirits are waiting to come down. They're like, okay, you want to go first? Okay, you go first. I'm coming next. They do line up. They, they do up. line up. Ka Kathleen did not, not a sweat. Not, <laughs> it's because, because they like you, Kathleen. <laughs> not a bead of sweat on her forehead. I was like, okay, we got one client due on the 20th, one due on the 25th. She's like, okay. And off we went. And it, it all worked out. The little monkeys. They, and they're beautiful. Well, like we preach to our clients to eat and to take naps and to lay down and to go to bed and to like, there were times I really paid for, for not like, it would be the night where I couldn't sleep and I was doing something. And then some sort of like, mm, I think something's going to happen. And I'd be like, oh, I should go to bed. And then I wouldn't. And then that would be when the client would text that something was happening and then it was on. And then it was like, okay, well, you can sleep tomorrow. But part of like managing that stress is also self-care. I mean, real, real care, because if you don't eat and you don't sleep, then you also can't be your best to you. And we want to be our best us. And, and you have to be able to function. If you don't sleep, you can't drive safely. <laughs> right. The, the, if, you, if you do this job right, in my humble opinion, you'll live a long, happy, healthy life. Because it requires you to put your self-care first, as Kathleen was saying. So when I have somebody do... I'm not going to have the nights where I'm up till midnight. I'm just not going to do that. My butt's going to be in bed. My butt might be in bed at eight, nine o'clock. Even if I'm not asleep, I'm in my bed. I'm resting. Because I can be called at any time. And I'm trying to, feed, I'm trying to put into words something that is, at this point is second nature to me, which is challenging. And that's why it's good for me to get, these, to get asked these questions every once in a while. When you're working with people, you get a feeling for when they're going to have their babies. That's for real. Medical people don't believe that, partly because they work with too many women at the same time. And they don't have a personal connection with them. And they're not talking to the client's ancestors and they're not praying for them. I do, and I suggest that y'all do. <laughs> because those little ones tell you when they're common. You feel it. And rather than saying, oh, rather than brushing that off and going on with your data, like that's not true, listen to that voice. And then you look back and go, oh my God, you know, something told me to take a nap and, and the phone went off. 
you know? After a while you do just get to start, when I'm on call, I sleep like a cat. I'm sleeping, but I'm not in a deep REM. I'm sleeping so that nothing but my phone sound will wake me up. Everything else I can sleep through. But when that ring, when that specific ring goes on for a client and there's a specific ring on this phone for my clients, if the client ring, I have a different ring for each one of my assistants, text and call. So I know which it's, I know which assistant is calling me. And I know when a client is calling me, all the mamas have the same ring. All the papas have the same ring. So I know, and that will wake me up. And your client ring has to be the loudest thing that you can get on your phone. I have an iPhone. There's a ring called the, the Euro siren. And it's the sound that European ambulances and fire trucks and police cars make when they're that ring get it use it because it has to wake you up you cannot sleep through that so in the beginning of being a new little doula it's, it, it is very challenging my heart goes out to you it will get better but after a while you will start to tune in to you know you can get your sleep but your body will know when that particular ring goes off, it's like Kavlov's dog. <laughs> and I'm a horrible waker. Any of y'all who have been silly enough to text me before nine o'clock in the morning, I've seen the snappy side of samsara. I don't like waking up early. I did my corporate life where I had to be at a desk at eight o'clock. I can't even imagine such horrors. Oof. That is not in my life anymore. I'm very happy about that. So yeah, I get very testy if I get you. Kathleen's look got, got the face on because you know everybody does it once and then they get growled at electronically. <laughs> I try to do nice, do it nicely, but it's not a cheery good morning. 